This week on the Back Table Podcast. If you refer somebody to somebody and they have a bad experience or a bad outcome, that certainly you take that kind of personally if you have pride in your profession. So it requires a lot of face time, which I would say was a little bit difficult in the last couple of years. I don't think Sonny and I actually met in person until very recently, although we've spoken many times and uh, many meetings, constant presenting of data. And also knowing who does this type of work, because I exist in a large group, but not everybody does this type of work because, again, as already been alluded to, it's not sexy work. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a brief message from our sponsor. The Concerto Detachable Quill Systems are shaped around the variety of patients you treat. Explore real-world case studies and share your own with hashtag Concerto Patient on Medtronic Peripheral Vascular Health Twitter channel at MDT Vascular. Now, back to the episode. Today we have a great episode. We're going to be discussing collaborating with GI on minimally invasive treatment of hemorrhoids with Jeremiah Tan, go by Jerry, and Sonny Bagla. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you for the invite. Hey, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, and our audience is mostly interventional cardiologists. We have some other endovascular specialties, vascular surgery, interventional cardiology. We'd like to do these collaborative episodes once in a while to talk about you know building new service lines, collaborating with other services on cases that we do routinely. But today we're going to talk more about the outpatient space and a service line that IRs can build in the outpatient space, specifically you know hemorrhoid embolization. But we also want to talk about how we collaborate with, for example, GI to help see those patients and work them up and also follow them. For me in my practice, mine is mostly hospital-based, so I'm used to just seeing GI. If it's a GI bleed or that's basically, or maybe some sort of biliary case, today I want to talk about something new. The audience already knows Sonny pretty well. Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about your practice and, and where you're at? Yeah, most of my training is local D.C. I consider myself a local Washingtonian, despite having grown up in western Maryland, basically close to West Virginia. But did most of my training, like undergrad, residency, med school residency, chief residency at GW, but then trained up in Boston for gastroenterology, where I spent most of the time learning advanced endoscopy, liver transplant, biliary cases, cancer, strictures, gallstones, things like that. Came back home in the early 2000s to join private practice and did that general GI and advanced cases for several years, but kind of taken a circuitous route in my career, like with the advanced drugs and therapies for inflammatory bowel disease, focused on that for several years. And my latest career kind of pivot has been towards more more novel therapies for anti-reflux therapy and mostly uh, endoscopic weight loss procedures or endobariatrics. So that's kind of where we are right now in my career. I work in a private practice. I work for Gastro Health, who is associated with Dr. Bagla. That's how we've kind of connected. And we, you know, GIs are practiced primarily in the outpatient space. So we're often the gatekeepers for a lot of this stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Sonny and I were talking about that, how you guys, GI has been in the outpatient space for decades, and it's kind of a new thing for IRs to be just out there outside the hospital. And Sonny has experience with that, with building IR centers and prostate centers. And so Sonny, will you tell us a little bit about how you started working with with Jerry and, and his group? Absolutely. So, you know, like Jerry mentioned, he's part of Gastro Health, which is a large GI group here in Northern Virginia. And I actually got to know his colleagues in some of the other regions around here who are in the same practice about 10, 15 years ago. And through them, I met Jerry and his group, his regional group. And we had a lot of educational dinners, you know, about meet and greets, who we are, what interventional radiology does, where we can help really in the setting of hemorrhoids. I mean, I had a little bit of a leg up in the sense that I knew a lot of his partners probably better, obviously, than I knew him initially and then got to know him through that route. Actually, it's funny, though, when Jerry was talking about where he was, and obviously Jerry's been involved in so many novel things, which is very parallel with IR. I was curious, Aaron, Jerry, what's been before this experience of collaborating with GI, what's been your impression of IR? It's funny, Aaron said we, you know, middle of the night GI bleeds or whatnot is where we overlap. He's right, but what's been your impression of like why you utilize IR services and what's been helpful and well, I think you've already brought it up. I mean, the, a gastroenterologist 
initial impression of an interventional radiologist is not usually in an emergent situation and in a hospital-based situation. Like you said, GI bleeds, varices, lower GI bleeds, embolizations, sometimes vascular access, enteral access, and those are typically uh, inpatient type settings. As an outpatient, I would suppose hepatocellular cancer. I guess portal hypertension too, right? Managing those patients. Some IRs are more hands-on with those patients than others. So Jerry, I mean, that's really, you know, I think one thing that's interesting to IRs, and this will be interesting to, I think, Aaron and, and the back table audience is the outpatient space, while we're all growing that way in IR and vascular cardiology, et cetera, in terms of the types of procedures we're doing, there's often a lack of understanding of it through your training, or maybe it's not really part and parcel of of your career or a well-known option. But in GI, where it's been around for so many decades, through your training, and as you came out earlier on, not obviously now, but earlier on, did you feel like working in the outpatient space because it's so intrinsic to GI is something that was either expected or you learned about or I think a lot of the training is geared towards an inpatient setting, you know, emergent cases. Fortunately, I trained at a place that was very much geared towards producing private practice gastroenterologists. I mean, certainly there was a research component, there was high levels of acuity, but at times of the year, you could learn to participate in outpatient endoscopy. Now, certainly there's a steep learning curve when you come out as far as tempo and pace and learning workflows to become efficient. So it's not intrinsically part of your training. I mean, I certainly couldn't do the volume of cases that I do now. And it's not because the cases are any easier, though you're more seasoned, but it's just you learn how to manage your time and get you through your day better and learn efficiencies as time goes by. I think that's a great point. Learning efficiency is not something you necessarily learn through your academic training. I mean, one thing we learned with our newer associates is that they can't be expected to do a full schedule paperwork that they have to learn and how to navigate the room and levels of assertiveness to employ. You know, the turn, room turnarounds are faster than what they would expect. Maybe they were used to doing three cases in the afternoon, whereas now they might be twice that. It's funny too, Jerry, they probably have more of an impact into that turnaround than they realize in a independent setting rather than the hospital. So you guys probably spend a lot of time coaching your younger associates too on the I call it like the intangibles of working in an outpatient setting. There's a lot of seasoning that has to happen, you know? Yeah, you got to learn how to manage people, you know? I mean, that's really hard. Yeah. And these are important, I think, for everyone to sort of understand. Yeah, it's great. From the GI perspective, hemorrhoid embolization is a, a pretty new procedure for IRs, right? I mean, Sonny, you'd agree with that, right? I mean, Yeah, no, I think so in terms of widespread knowledge about it. Absolutely. Yeah, we're starting to hear, especially on social media and just through the grapevine and more and more people employing it and both in the hospital and outpatient setting. But from the GI perspective, I think it'd be interesting to if you could educate our audience on like what are the current standard treatment options for hemorrhoids and how these patients typically present. Well, along the lines of we're talking about training versus practice, I mean, certainly management of hemorrhoids is not a widely taught part of the curriculum as a fellow, unless things have changed since I've been a fellow, which is 20 years. But one thing you kind of rapidly learn is that in practice is that you're kind of the gatekeeper to a lot of these diseases and many of your not unsubstantial number of consults that you have is for hemorrhoids um, and rectal bleeding and it's something I learned very early on in my career and realized that you know they're really in the early 2000s there really wasn't much to offer other than topical therapy or some fiber and some non-specific lifestyle modifications that you could do so i mean we've kind of gone on this journey leading up to meeting sunny where in the late 2008 or something like that you know we were looking for other therapies we started with one of my partners dr hijab and i brought on infrared coagulation to treat hemorrhoids with modest efficacy but you know not insignificant number of patient complaints And maybe about, I don't know, 10 years ago, we started doing hemorrhoid banding in the clinic, trying to find some possibly more effective but less uncomfortable methods to manage hemorrhoids in the office other than just conservative management. Typically, I would say in the last couple of years, that's been the kind of standard. It's a combination of lifestyle management, fiber, topicals, and rubber band ligation. And that's kind of where we were up until, until the current point in time. Jerry, with those, what are some of the drawbacks you guys had with those treatments? So rubber band ligation, RBL, seems to be the most popular amongst gastroenterologists or even surgeons. And what are your thoughts on where you don't want to do it or or patient-related issues? I mean, it does have a very high efficacy 
and obviously it's office based, so it's easy and quick for the for the provider or physician. So what are the times that you think, hey, you know, this isn't gonna work or Well certainly if they have a coagulopathy or if they're on anticoagulants, it's kind of a, a judgment on patient level of tolerance. Also if they have very non specific complaints, you know, I don't think it's gonna work. If you have a specific t- complaint to treat like bleeding or pressure, I think there's better outcomes with that than just kind of like vague discomfort itch. It's probably more likely to be successful. And then as far as pain goes with your experience with IRC, like post-operative or perioperative discomfort for the patient, do you find IRC or rubber band ligation, which is giving patients, which would give patients more of a perioperative pain in the ass, if you will, over one or the other? Probably the IRC. The rubber banding, you know, they can have some pain, but if you identify it early enough, you can repeat a rectal exam and kind of like, for lack of a better word, jimmy the band a little bit looser because it probably means you grabbed a little bit too much of the the muscle layer. So usually just kind of like even like one rotation of the rubber band, you can almost feel them like physically unclench as the pain goes away. It's, It's kind of a palpable sense of relief. Very rarely have we had to do a urgent flex sig to cut the band off. I can only think of really once in my career where we had to really do that. You know, we look at these as opportunities, right, for IR and for any collaboration. Even now, GI would look at an opportunity to avoid them from having to go to surgery. I'm sure, Jerry, you'd agree, right? If you can if you can solve this without having to get a hemorrhoidectomy, the patient will be very thankful, right? But one thing I want to ask is, Jerry, can you explain, because again, from an IR perspective, we probably have limited understanding of this, this procedure, like RBL, is very easy for you guys. Like, it's quick, it's easy technically. I mean, from the from a throughput standpoint, it's something that I think overall, I don't want people to who are interventional radiologists to think that this is, oh, it's got all this, it's bad things only. It's from a speed, efficiency, and a technical aspect for you as an experienced gastroenterologist, it's straightforward, right? Oh, yeah, it's very straightforward. Then the patient's tolerated very well. The device assembly is very quick. It does require multiple sessions, which can, in a busy schedule, can be sometimes hard to coordinate, but the patient's tolerated pretty well. And I would say that there's a decent efficacy with it. So, like, then where does hemorrhoid embolization fit in? If it... <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. I could, let me, I could jump in there, and, and Jerry can agree or disagree, I guess. But I, I'd say when we approached Jerry's group and the other GI groups in the area, and this is many years ago, before even being as collaborative as we are now, you know, where were the holes in the treatment options? And so, like Jerry said, we looked at it and did our research into saying, okay, one, is it an ignored disease? And it kind of is. I think, Jerry, right, you kind of get went into that a little bit about during training. It may not be paid attention to as much as we like to say it should be, right? It's certainly not a glamour disease. Yeah, exactly. No one's no one's looking at this and saying, hey, I want to be like, I want to be the hemorrhoid expert of the world. But we looked at it, one, there's a large patient population obviously that's affected. And two, while there are these other options, IRC, banding, and then ultimately, you know, surgery, which does have very good outcomes, but comes with some morbidity. Could we fit in that middle ground of people who are not good candidates for RBL, so they may be the patients on anticoagulation or dual antiplatelets. The people who couldn't necessarily or tolerate maybe adjustment of those bands or multiple sessions, which it sometimes will take or oftentimes takes. And then you have the the rarer patient, but it does occur. Patients, I think, like inflammatory bowel disease or other rectal pathology that they may not be great candidates for banding because of risk for other complications. And so that was our approach. I think, Jerry, as we've learned about this, you know, what are your thoughts on where it would fit in? Is that is that still probably the best place or those the best places where it fits in? You know, a hemorrhoidectomy comes with its morbidities and it's probably, as described to me, one of the more uncomfortable procedures you could have. It has a role and it's effective, but the prolonged recovery from it could be a, a negative factor for it. So Hemorrhoid embolization has certainly been a consideration when it's somebody that you think may not tolerate a hemorrhoidectomy very well. Yeah, so Aaron, with that, I mean, if you look at your question of where does it fit in, I think in that algorithm, it's like, okay, what's quick and easy and cheap and mostly effective is still conservative therapy and banding. But then if you take out this subset of patients who don't do well, don't tolerate, but you don't necessarily want them to go on to surgery just yet, now they might need to, and hopefully it's a small percentage, I think that is probably the ideal person to be thinking about for the procedure. Recently, 
Just this past week, Alex Puitapa, one of our partners and works with Jerry as well too, interventional radiologist, he just led an experience and published in JVIR, and I think, I don't know, 150 patients. I think it's the largest publication in the world looking at ambulatory hemorrhoid artery embolization and the success rate. And that'd be worth, you know, future discussion. Yeah. Just to let everybody know, we've already invited Alex. Oh, great. He accepted. He will be coming on the show shortly and we'll get into the technical nitty gritty about how he performs those procedures and also, you know, his work up and, and from A to Z, how he does those. So basically, if it's a patient who's failed conservative treatment, they failed banding, maybe that's who you're sending on Jerry to, to Sonny and his, and Alex to, to actually have embolization done performed. Yeah, typically there's some judgment involved too. I have sent some cases where you've done a colonoscopy to rule out more nefarious causes of rectal bleeding and you've identified kind of larger hemorrhoids and there's certainly a judgment call that comes with experience saying that the things that I have to offer are just not going to benefit this person and going straight to the most effective therapy rather than kind of like serially taking them through a bunch of bandings every other week because usually it's a series of three bandings like every other week it's a judgment call of if i think that this is going to be effective and if i don't think it is i'll just refer to sunny in his practice got it and how has it been with your colleagues your vi you know partners with also adopting that sort of pathway has there been resistance in the group or have you seen resistance at uh, GI conferences, for example? I would think within the group, it's really just about having it front of mind as an option. The medicine is easy. It's the, the business development, the awareness, the kind of like that internal marketing to know that this is an option. There has been some pushback in the community from, you know, the surgeons, which we've had multiple discussions about because, you know, and needed kind of education and reassurance and presentation of data of its efficacy and safety. That's key. It's like what Jerry mentioned is that pushback, I think one of its passive, right, is, and you get over that by consistent education. There might be some active pushback amongst people who feel threatened, but also those educational efforts are important. You have to stick at them. I mean, in our practice, we're very data-driven, so we want to collect those outcomes data. We want to make sure that it's algorithmic, but Aaron, there's no doubt about it. Anytime, like I've seen this throughout my career, is anytime you go and get involved in something that is normally managed and followed through by another specialty, that critical piece of continued education and communication has to be there. Yeah, Sonny, I mean, you've seen this with prostate reembolization, with urologists, with yep. uh, with the ortho space now, embolizations. Any parallels or pearls from those experiences that you've been able to take over the GI? I think every specialty is, has its own kind of culture. Yes. I don't know if you guys probably agree. Yeah. How's that been working with GI docs versus, your, you know, for example, urologists? So every one of these disease processes, it's really important to understand the background politics, right? So in GI, for example, even in a very busy banding practice, hemorrhoids are not necessarily the sexy thing, right? And there are a lot of other diseases that are maybe more interesting from a pathologic standpoint or just from a volume standpoint takes up their time. The same happens in the ortho space and the urology space. And whether that business makes up a portion of their revenue or their their business model, model is important for IR to consider and then be considerate of. And that's that's played a big part into how we educate, right? You know, you can tell people whatever you want about a disease or a process or finance or convenience for a patient, but you have to be transparent about all of it. You have to say, you know, when you're working with them, each of the different specialists, you have to understand what do they want? What do they want for the patient? What's going to make it easy? uh, What the outcomes are? And then look at the good and bad. And they're all slightly different, like you said. But knowing that ahead of time and honestly speaking about it openly, I think is key. Because we were doing, before this collaboration with Jerry's practice, you know, we were doing hemorrhoid embolization with a previous practice since, you know, 2014, 15. But it was repetitive, ongoing education, repetitive meetings, getting feedback, looking at outcomes, seeing how people were doing. And it wasn't just a turn the switch hey, Jerry, send me all your hemorrhoid patients. I mean, that's not going to work. And this is where I could help, but not really diving deep into being honest about where we're good, where we're bad, and where things are costly, you know, everything. They don't want to just hand off their patient without knowing all of these intricate details. Right. Uh, Along those same lines, Jerry, like, can you give some advice 
to IRs in our audience about what's the best way to approach a GI group or individual even that they want to work or collaborate with on any service line, maybe even specifically hemorrhoid embolization? Yeah, I mean, it's frequent meetings, honestly. Frequent meetings, education, trust needs to be built. Just like all physicians who refer to other specialties, it's a reflection on you. And if you refer somebody to somebody and they have a bad experience or a bad outcome, that certainly you take that kind of personally if you have pride in your profession. So it requires a lot of face time, which I would say was a little bit difficult in the last couple of years. I don't think Sonny and I actually met in person until very recently, although we've spoken many times and uh, many meetings, constant presenting of data. And also knowing who does this type of work, because I exist in a large group, but not everybody does this type of work because, again, as already been alluded to, it's not sexy work. I'm a little bit more willing to handle people's problems, whatever. I'm not terribly selective. And Aaron, what Jerry's saying, I think, speaks a lot into the follow-up of the patients. Yeah. Having a handle on the follow-up because they do require a lot of hand-holding. You know, we talk about in the urology space, PPH patients' symptoms will fluctuate on and off because it's going to be a daily problem, even if you've made an improvement. The same goes for a hemorrhoid patient and getting involved in somebody who's got hemorrhoids, whether they undergo surgery, banding, IRC, embolization, their symptoms will likely fluctuate throughout the course of their life. So that follow-up where, at least in the way we work, you know, we see them initially in their follow-up to make sure periprocedurally they're better and then they're at least symptomatically better and they don't require anything else immediately. We are very cognizant of the fact that these patients need to be back at their GI doc to be looked at for other pathology. They're obviously, they're going to be getting their colon cancer screening now from, say, 45 onwards. And so these are real big pieces of the puzzle that oftentimes people forget is if you don't have that tie-in and follow-up, then there's not that trust factor of who is doing what. That was going to be my one of my key questions is like, how are they being followed post-embolization? And again, we'll get into that kind of more detail with, with Alex and his protocol. But Jerry, have you seen any issues with that where people get lost to follow up? And, and that's also kind of, I guess, imagine a way where you lose trust pretty quickly. That hasn't really happened. They, Sonny and his team have been really good about following up and the patients have been good about following up if they have continued symptoms. And often they have other coexistent complaints that I see them for anyway. So it's really about lowering that barrier to follow up to make yourself accessible to the patient. And as far as what you were, to go back to what you were talking about, advice for interventional radiologists and interfacing with GIs, like to make that barrier to making the referral as seamless as possible. We certainly worked through some workflows to make it as simple for me to make a referral without getting stuck in the the abyss of the EMR, <laughs> right? That Remember that workflow? Oh, yeah. So we, we came up with a very easy way to get the, the referral to Sonny and his team. And certainly at, at the beginning of this collaboration, I was kind of, my OCD would kick in. I'd be like, send you another referral. And he would be like, we're, we're going to check on it. And just to make it as seamless as possible and that communication direct and as seamless as possible. Yeah, no, I'm sure I'm sure Sonny and those guys have a well-run machine from what it sounds like. I was meaning like in your history of working with IRs, that's where I've seen, and again, like you guys, I mean, you guys keep mentioning communication, but I learned an early lesson about if you have a bad outcome or there's a complication you get that referring doc on the phone immediately, almost before you, you tell a family member, just so that they're aware and they can help you managing the issues. And that's where I've seen people lose trust, including myself. Again, early career mistakes, and it's a hard learned lesson. But I think that's like one of the most important things for any of, any of those who are you know straight out or in training in our audience. Sonny, anything else? Any more advice on you know if somebody wants to kind of start this as part of their practice? Like we talked about, it, the biggest thing will be delve into the current literature. Yeah. You know, what is out there, go to meetings, learn about it. And I would say if you're an IR, it's going to serve you well to learn about IRC, banding, hemorrhoidectomy, and maybe not just on a surface level. I think the more you speak to your local community docs before you lead into it with, hey, I got this procedure I want to talk to you about, you may want to lead into it where you're learning about them and what they're currently doing. Because if you have a real good, deep understanding of the community docs, academic, whoever they are around you, and where they're feeling like they have a shortcoming in their clinical practice, you'll be able to offer that help. So I would say you got to dive deep. And we all truthfully like to think we do that. But I think having a good, deep understanding of the disease process and the treatments, that's going to help carry the conversation forward. This isn't 
in my opinion, a very wide open sort of green pasture space because there are so many patients with the disease that are probably undertreated throughout many communities. And there's an opportunity for this type of collaboration just through simple means of learning and education. And I think that would be my advice, more so than in other areas where in the urology space, in the orthopedic space, where there are already very set algorithms for how patients are treated when it comes to knee pain or BPH or other novel IR therapies. And one more question along the lines, Sunny. You mentioned that you guys have been doing it for a while in your practice. Have you, how have you seen hemorrhoid embolization evolve? Has it improved in any way over the, you know, since you guys started doing them? I think absolutely. You know, we started, you know, was it seven, 2015? So probably was it seven years ago now. It was a procedure where early on we were utilizing from a technical aspect, just coils. And we were only embolizing perhaps superior rectal artery branches. And we didn't know when we needed to target middle rectal artery branches and how many arteries to target. And you know, sometimes, honestly, which coils were more occlusive than others in terms of recanalization rates. And Alex will get into that, I'm sure, with you, you know, with that experience. But these are the technical aspects that evolved. Okay, now do we use beads and why? And do we need to treat the middle rectal artery up front versus, you know, this is probably not going to be a big deal. I think that's that experiential thing that's changed over the years. And it's something we've seen. I know the group out of Europe has seen this in South America, and we've learned this together. And I think that's something you'll probably see small modifications. But as Alex shares with you from our most recent experience of last few hundred patients, it can be really consistent, good results with taking into mind all of this experiential knowledge that's been gained over the last seven to 10 years. Final thoughts, guys, before we finish up, that's all I got. No, I think, Jerry, maybe one thing I wanted to ask you too is comparatively, when you start to get involved with IR in a novel space like this, you know, in and around hemorrhoid embolization, how do you start to look at other ways that you can collaborate with IR? Does it open your mind to think, hey, whether it's, you know, in the advanced endo world, are there other applications where you can do collaborative cases or share technologies or experiences? What are your thoughts on that? I was thinking about this. It goes back to that inpatient, outpatient world. You know, the inpatient stuff obviously would be the inpatient group there. But in our collaboration, the other thing that certainly it would be enteral access for people who have refractory gastroparesis or any other number of ways that they're not able to take nutrition orally. That's the other thing I could think of. I think, Aaron, that goes a long way. You know, once you start to collaborate on one thing, and it can really start to open up other items where IRs can really make a difference to these patients. I mean, you're talking about G-tubes. Yeah. G-J. Yeah. J's aren't, they're not fun, that's for sure. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's like in every specialty, Jerry, just so you know, right, there's like, you know, what you guys consider the sexy and unsexy. And yeah. this is the same thing in IR. But I always go back to this. It's like, whether we can help with enteral access, vascular access, soft tissue biopsies, it doesn't matter. Like, if you have that relationship at the end of the day, first of all, the referring doc is exceptionally happy. The patient is really the primary the primary goal of who's happy, and they get a less invasive and I think an easy, easy, simple care is what we like to say. So that that that's important. But you're right, Aaron, nobody really loves the, the wire going around the C-sweep. They don't like it either. Don't worry. What I was going to say as far as the relationship building, I mean, the cheapest thing's a phone call. And, hey, this this is the case I've got. Do you have something you can offer that is maybe uh, out of the box or non-traditional than I would normally do? Because normally I'd send the patient to the hospital and the whole procedure and maybe make it as seamless. Maybe if there's another option to make it a little more seamless for the patient. Yeah. Well, great points, guys. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aaron. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sherry. Have a good one. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. 
Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 